In October of 1871, Lieutenant Robert Carter and the 4th Cavalry were asked to hunt down the Comanche. Horrific attacks against the American settlers on the frontier had made the region unlivable. Two years earlier, the Transcontinental Railroad had been completed, but a massive piece of land in the middle of the country had been left unconquered. The harsh conditions of the high plains and the ferocity of the inhabitants had led to this land, Comancheria, to be bypassed. For decades, the wagon trains and soldiers who went into the area would disappear. Rumors of what happened to them were the thing of nightmares. The fears of settlers on the fringes of the territory were made real with a recent uptick in Comanche raids. As Robert Carter entered the territory, part of him already knew that as the hunter, he may become the hunted. Was the army finally ready to take on the Comanche? Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. But before we get to our story, let's take a moment to talk about health. In the time of the 19th century, nutrition was a primary concern of citizens. Scarcity and a lack of variety in diets led to malnutrition. It's something that we still deal with today. Which is why I am proud to announce this episode is sponsored by AG1. AG1 is a science-driven formulation of vitamins, probiotics, and whole food sourced ingredients that support brain, gut, and immune health. I have started drinking AG1 as part of my daily routine. I make my way to the kitchen and grab my AG1 from its canister out of the fridge. I fill up my shaker, take one scoop, shake it up, that's my favorite part, then head outside to drink it where I yell at birds. I've always felt that the most important part of any health routine are the first steps, because for me it has always led to compounding good choices. I find that if I work out in the morning, I am more likely to eat well that day. And I find if I take my AG1, I'm more likely to work out. Good behaviors feed into each other. AG1 is the real deal too. It's third party tested and NSF certified for sport. You are drinking exactly the product on the label, and that's important to me. Everyone wants to elevate their baseline health, so check it out. Head to the link in the video description. With your first purchase of AG1, you'll receive a free one year supply of AG vitamin D3K2, plus five AG1 travel packs for when you're on the go. Your health is essential, so you won't regret it. But let's get to our story. Just two years into the Grant presidency, it was becoming clear that his Indian policy was failing. Pragmatic in some sense, and idealistic in others, he recognized that the country was going to expand with or without his approval. The painting, American Progress, by John Gast, presents the picture perfectly. As the American homesteaders push west, supported by the infrastructure of the United States, they push off the land the Indians and the buffalo. Grant's policy toward the Indians was one of assimilation. He once said in a letter to General Sherman that he wished his policies would help protect them from the encroachment by the whites. He felt that in time they could become Christianized and civilized. Specific terms that he used in his first inaugural address. But what do you do with those who don't want your religion or your civilization? Among those who resisted were the Comanche, the most powerful and dangerous of all the Indian tribes. A group responsible for more death and destruction than all the other tribes of the West combined. As Americans encroached on their territory, the frequency of conflicts increased. Any settlers on the fringes of Comancheria were in danger. Raids took place frequently. The brutality of the Comanche and allies of theirs like the Kiowa were being noticed. Grant's policy of peace led military leaders to worry. Settlers were fleeing the frontier. One colonel was quoted as saying, If the Indian marauders are not punished, the whole country seems in a fair way of becoming totally depopulated. Many began to favor a more aggressive policy toward groups like the Comanche. But there wasn't enough support yet, not until 1871, when one of the most brutal raids ever was conducted. On May 18, 1871, a wagon train of 12 men was taking supplies to the forts of Texas. While in the Salt Creek Prairie, they spotted a large group of Indian warriors. They were Kiowa and Comanche. Henry Warren, the leader of the wagon train, had his men shift into a defensive ring but it was no use. The force of over 100 warriors quickly overwhelmed them. Five members of the wagon train were able to escape. The warriors, preoccupied with supplies, did not pursue them as they fled. One of the Teamsters was able to make it to Fort Richardson. Once inside the fort, he told the soldiers what happened. A group of the 4th Cavalry was dispatched to inspect the site. Lieutenant Robert Carter reports what they found. Quote, there could be nothing more appalling, heart-rendering, or sickening to the human senses than the spectacle of the Salt Creek Prairie Massacre. The poor victims were stripped, scalped, and horribly mutilated." End quote. In horrific detail, he described the scene. Seven of the men were dead. Their bodies, filled with arrows, resembled porcupines. Some were decapitated. Evidence shows that one of the men put up a fight. The warriors captured him, 
strapped him to a wagon wheel and slowly roasted him to death over a fire. In a twist of fate, the warriors had passed up an opportunity earlier that day to attack General William T. Sherman and about 20 soldiers. The Warren party had met up with Sherman only an hour prior to the attack. General Sherman looked to Colonel Ronald S. McKenzie to bring the fugitives to justice. McKenzie was a Civil War veteran, known to many as Bad Hand because of a gruesome injury that he had received during the war. McKenzie was a capable soldier who would become essential to future military success against the Comanche. But for now, he was just learning how to fight on the high plains. It didn't take the military long to start making arrests. A Kiowa chief named Satanta admitted to killing the seven men on the wagon train. He cited how the United States was planning on building a railroad to the territory and how they had not received the items that were promised to them by the Indian agencies. Satanta and a few other chiefs would be convicted of the murders and imprisoned. This is where we begin to see a shift in policy. The damage being done on the frontier was too much. Settlers had already been pleading with Sherman to do something about these raids. They claimed hundreds of deaths from attacks that occurred over the years. Although the Salt Creek Massacre was largely led by the Kiowa, the biggest offenders of attacks were a band of the Comanche known as the Guajati. When tribes like the Kiowa and Comanche were ordered to come to reservations, the Guajati refused. In fact, they had never signed a treaty with whites, or abided by the rules set by those who did. They wouldn't even trade with white people at least not directly. Their own chief, ironically, was the product of a Comanche raid. In 1836, Cynthia Ann Parker was taken captive at just nine years old in an attack on the Parker Fort. She was adopted into the tribe and later married the chief, Peter Nakona. Their son, Quanta Parker, became the final chief of the Comanche. Regardless, as the Quahati refused to come to reservation, the military had to decide what to do with them. Soldiers under McKenzie's command, like Lieutenant Robert Carter, waited for orders. It must have been incredibly nerve-wracking. Carter called the Quahati, quote, the wildest and most hostile band of the Comanche tribe, and the most inveterate raiders on the Texas border, end quote. For decades, wagon trains and Texas ranchers that would just go near the territory would never return. They were expert horsemen, warriors, and strategists. By 1870, they were equipped with guns but their arrows were their most deadly weapons. Accurate at up to 60 yards, they are said to be able to shoot 20 a minute. In September, orders finally came in. General Sherman stated that actions had to be taken to punish and pursue these murderers. For too long, the army had avoided Comancheria, but now it was time to head into the wolf's den and to bring the Quahati into reservation by force or to wipe them out. All they had to do was find them and survive. The Guajati were known to inhabit a region of the country that we call the High Plains. It is the last region of the country to be conquered by the U.S. military, and for good reason. My favorite description of the area comes from S.C. E. Gwen's Empire of the Summer Moon. Quote, Not only were the High Plains generally without timber and water, they were also subject to one of the least hospitable climates in North America. In the summer came brutal heat and blowtorch winds, often 100 degrees or hotter that would later destroy whole crops in a matter of days. The winds caused the eyes to burn, the lips to crack, and the body to dehydrate with alarming speed. In the fall and winter, there was a frequent norther, a sudden strong wind from the north, often at gale force. A norther could send the temperature plunging by 50 degrees in an hour. A blue norther had the additional feature of freezing driven rain." End quote. One region in West Texas was even more infamous the Llano Estacado. It translates to the Staked Plains, a name it earned from early Spanish explorers. The meaning was simple. Without marking the land with stakes, it would become impossible to tell direction, a grassland that seemingly goes on forever. General Randolph Marcy wrote of it in a report to the Army in 1852. Quote, when we were upon the high tableland, a view presented itself as boundless as the ocean. Not a tree, shrub, or any other object, either animate or inanimate, relieved the dreary monotony. It was a vast, illimitable expanse of desert prairie, the Great Sahara of North America. It is a region almost as vast and trackless as the ocean." End quote. He goes on to explain that no man could permanently live there. But he was wrong. The Guajati did. They preferred it. The same things that made this band so brutal and effective were supported by the plains. As a horse tribe, the plains acted as highways, allowing them to travel unbelievable distances in a single day. Their horses had food to graze in all directions. The water sources were few, but the Guajati knew where they were, an advantage over any intruder. But what was most important to them on the plains was that it was the home of the buffalo, their primary food source. They were the most valuable resource in the region, 
and one worth defending. The Comanche ability to move on horseback and fight that way made them an unmatched force in the continent until the 1840s. In previous decades, slow-moving armies were no threat to them. They could fight, if they chose, if they liked their odds. Comanche arrows were a far superior weapon to slow, muzzle-loading rifles. That is, until technology caught up. In 1844, the Texas Rangers broke out a new weapon against the Comanche, the Colt Revolver. This even the playing field. Armed with revolvers, the Rangers had a five-round cylinder for rapid firing. They carried additional preloaded cylinders that they could quickly switch out for additional rounds. The Battle of Walker's Creek proved that rapid fire was an effective way to fight the Comanche. By the 1870s, gun technology had further improved. American cavalry now carried the Spencer carbine. Not a revolver, but a highly accurate rifle with a seven-round magazine. Its lever action made it possible to fire at a similar rate to the Comanche arrows, but at a much greater distance. The technology made it possible to fight them in a pitched battle. But remember, the Comanche didn't have to fight. Not if they didn't want to. It was the advantage of the planes. The warriors would keep several mounts with them, always keeping some fresh and able to run. You could chase them, but pursuing Comanche provided its own dangers. It's easy to get lost in an ocean of grass. If spread out, supply lines are vulnerable, and unless you know exactly where you are, finding water can become impossible. And that's all assuming that you don't lose your horse. Many Texas Rangers died in their attempts. With the world closing in on them, no one had yet proved that they could effectively fight the Comanche in their home. Bad Hand was the first to have the order, not just to defend the settlers on the Texas frontier, but to go hunt down the Comanche. Lieutenant Robert Carter received the order from Mackenzie in late September 1871. It was impossible to know where the main village of the Quahati would be. They were going to look for the Comanche near Blanco Canyon. It is to the east of the Cap Rock Escarpment, in the low rolling plains. The geography there offered ravines and canyons for concealment next to the high plains. The Quahati were known to commonly conduct raids in that area this time of year. The force of men were 600 strong most on horseback from the 4th Cavalry. They brought 20 Takwa with them as scouts. As enemies of the Comanche and expert trackers, it was thought that they would make excellent guides. But Carter noticed apprehension among the Talks, as he called them. He had no doubt that they were brave, but questioned whether or not they truly wanted to find the Comanche. Ten days into the expedition, they hadn't found any sign of them. Maybe their experiences had taught them better. But on the evening of October 9th, the Talks noticed something. They were being watched. Four Comanche off in the distance had been keeping an eye on the Americans. Maybe they had known about the Americans the whole time. Maybe they wanted to be seen, so the Americans were aware that they knew. The scouts tried to give chase, but in typical Comanche fashion, their fresh mounts gave them an advantage. On the march for ten days, the military horses gave out quickly. Over the rolling hills near Blanco Canyon, the Comanche disappeared. The Tonks were sure they must be close to the Comanche village, but that meant that they were close to the Comanche. Carter notes that the Americans made several mistakes in their camp that night. The men lit fires for light and comfort, but fire acts like a beacon on the plains for anyone looking for you. Certain regiments recklessly left their horses without guards, certain that the Comanche riders would not be back. In the camp, around midnight, all was quiet. Years later, Robert Carter would publish a book of his experiences. It's titled, On the Border with Mackenzie. He wrote of the night of October 9th. Quote, It drew near midnight. All was still except the night noises of the horse herds grazing at the end of their lariats. The fires, which had been allowed, an air of indulgence to the men, and a few slumbering embers of one of the nearest to us flashed up, sparked, and died down. And all was dark. Almost inky darkness. When suddenly a yell, followed by a shot, rang down the valley. Then, in succession of unearthly, blood-curdling yells, a dozen shots in quick succession, one after the other. A rush, and in an instant, our whole camp was aroused." End quote. It was a terrifying moment, but it was clear within seconds what was happening. Carter continues, quote, The camp was attacked. The rapid flashes of the carbines and pistols from the rear squadron, now in action, showed us at intervals that the ridge or line of small foothills which skirted our entire camp was alive with wild Indians, riding at full speed, shaking dried buffalo robes, ringing bells, and yelling like wild demons. End quote. Officers were shouting orders as they tried to regain composure. Then it dawned on Carter. The Comanche were after their horses. 
In the middle of the fighting comes the heavy sound of rolling thunder, something Carter says that once experienced under a cavalry command is never mistaken. The Comanche had been successful. The animals were stampeding. Screams by officers are made to stand by your horses. As the men try to grab the lariats of the running animals, the leather lacerated their hands. The herds of horses thundered off into the distance away from that of the army and into the darkness of the Comanche. But no further attack from the Comanche came that night. Why? From the Comanche perspective, they didn't have to. This was a common tactic. Without a horse in the plains, most wouldn't be able to carry enough supplies or protection to travel far enough for water. It was a strategy they used to strand people. They would let the geography kill their enemies for them. Seventy horses and mules were lost in the attack. It left a large portion of the force without mounts. The parties that lost horses were the ones that left them unguarded. The Comanche had been watching. They knew. The tribe was able to deal a substantial blow to the Americans before they even knew they were there. Carter describes this as the first tragedy of Blanco Canyon. There would be three more that follow. By morning, the Tonks were able to pick up the trail of the stampeding horses. The men would have to be cautious of the Comanche, but it was imperative to the mission that they try to recoup some of their losses. Carter joins an officer, Captain Edward Hale, with five men he served with for years. One of them is a private named Sander Gregg. Carter knows these men well. They're brave. But he didn't know Hale's men. They were new recruits. The soldiers head out on horseback to follow the trails. They make it a mile or two from the main force when, over a ridge, they find a small group of Comanche rounding up some of the horses that stampeded the night before. When the Comanche see them, they flee on horseback. Lieutenant Carter, Captain Hale, and around ten other soldiers chase after them. As they run, they get further away from the main force. The Comanche continue down ravines and across an arroyo. Carter and the soldiers pursue. They ascend a small hill and continue a few hundred yards before the soldiers realize their mistake. Carter describes what he saw. Quote, there at the base of the bluff could be seen in the clear light of the approaching day the ground fairly swarming with Indians, all mounted and galloping toward us with whoops and blood-curdling yells that for the moment seemed to take the breath completely from our bodies. End quote. Captain Hale was the first to speak. Heavens, but we are in a nest. They had been led right into a trap. There on the bluff rode hundreds of warriors, naked to the waist. Both the men and horses were covered in war paint. Many were fully adorned with war bonnets or feathered headdresses. Carter had to think quickly about what to do or everyone would be massacred. There was no cover where they stood. Carter ordered the men to spread out into a line so they could cover their flanks. They were going to have to slowly retreat back to the arroyo. They could fire at the Comanche as they did to keep them at bay. The sounds of their rifles would alert the main force and McKenzie would send help. The rapid fire of the Spencer carbines caused the advancing Comanche to falter and hesitate. Carter says he could hear the women behind the warriors screaming and urging them on. Then it dawned on him. This was a Comanche camp. The whole village was close. If they could survive long enough for backup to arrive, then they could accomplish what they had come here to do. But in this terrifying situation, panic set in. A few Comanche subchiefs made their way to the front of the Indian formation carrying long poles. Hanging from them were the scalps of their killed enemies. At the front of the men was Quanta Parker, their chief, urging them on and leading them to fight. He was large and covered in black war paint. As the Comanche continued their approach, Captain Hale and his new recruits started to break. Carter wrote of them, quote, Seeing the ultimatum of being surrounded and massacred unless assistance arrived very soon, chose to trust to their horses' heels in an endeavor to escape, rather than face longer the ferocious Quahatis, whose wild yells, whoops, screams, and screeches now sounded so unpleasantly close to their ears. End quote. Carter screamed at Hale and his men, cursing for them to stop. As they ran away, he knew he couldn't follow. The Comanche are in fresh mounts. He knows if they flee, they are going to get run down and finished. Instead of chasing after the fleeing men, the Comanche focused in on Carter and his remaining companions. There were just five of them to hold off over a hundred warriors. The Comanches were more emboldened now. ...and bows and worked to encircle Carter and his men. The soldiers were still hundreds of yards from the arroyo they could use for cover. Carter ordered the soldiers to dismount and keep falling back. They kept using suppressive fire, trying to hold off the Comanche until they were close enough to make a final run for cover. The range of the Comanche weapons did not match the carbines. They had to stay back. The Comanche would blitz and the soldiers would use their horses for cover. Several were hit by arrows. The Comanche were getting closer. Two of Carter's men were shot, one in the hand and another in the arm. 
After what seemed like an eternity, it was finally time to make the run. Carter yelled his orders. Quote, Now, men, bunch your shots, pump it into them, and make a dash for your lives. It is all we can do. End quote. The men mounted their horses after firing a final large volley and encouraged their mounts to gallop. Private Seander Gregg rode ten yards to the right of Carter. Very quickly, Carter noticed Gregg's horse begin to falter. Gregg yelled, Lieutenant, my horse is giving out. Quanta Parker and the other Comanche noticed immediately. Their horses galloped toward Private Gregg, racing each other as they went. Carter writes of witnessing Quanta Parker, quote, He seemed the incarnation of savage, brutal joy. His face was smeared with black war paint, which gave his features a satanic look, end quote. As Parker approached Gregg, Carter tried to intervene, but the Comanche was an expert. He stayed to the outside, using Gregg's slower horse for cover. Carter yelled for Gregg to pull a six-shooter as Parker made his final approach, but he reached for it too late. Parker was on top of him. As the chief rode beside him, he held his pistol to Gregg's head and fired. Carter watched as Private Gregg fell dead from his horse. He called this the second tragedy of Blanco Canyon. Two to go. Following the execution of Private Gregg, Lieutenant Carter fully expected that he and the rest of his men were next. But then, their fortunes changed. Without even stopping to take a trophy, Parker and the rest of the Comanche turned around and retreated. The lives of the soldiers had been spared, and a moment later, Carter spotted why. Breaking over a distant hill were the Tonkawa scouts, screaming and war whooping on their horses to join the fight. Behind them was a massive line of dust. Mackenzie had heard the fight as Carter had hoped, and the main force was marching to join them. Carter remembered the screams of the women behind the soldiers from earlier in the fight. Parker was retreating from this camp because the whole village must have been close. He had to get them on the move if they had any chance to avoid the Americans. Comanche warriors with fresh mounts could have avoided the soldiers at will, but a village of people is different. Women, children, elderly. These villages are made to be moved, but they have materials. They can't move at a high speed, not at the pace of soldiers. On their way in, Mackenzie's forces picked up the retreating Captain Hale. 500 Americans now pursued the Comanche. They moved west to the Caprock Escarpment, the climb to the High Plains. As the Americans approached, the Comanche retreated up the side of a steep bluff. Comanche women at the top screamed down to the soldiers, and the Comanche marksmen covered Qantas' force as they retreated. The Tonka was screamed at the Comanche across battle lines. Mackenzie's force was close behind them. Lieutenant Carter led a group of men after them, up a trail to the plateau. His racing horse took a turn in the trail too sharp, and a boulder jetting out smashed into his leg. He says the impact sounded like the crack of a pistol. His vision went dark. The next thing he remembered, he was being given water from his men. The Indian horses had been far fresher than the American ones. As the Americans approached, the last of the Quahati disappeared into the hills and ravines. Quana had escaped to warn the village, leaving the Americans with nothing. Carter calls this tragedy number three. One more. After the Comanche had disappeared, Carter retraced back to where Greg had been killed. His leg was badly injured, but the soldiers with him helped him bury his friend. The events of the day had all happened before noon. Around 2.30 p.m., the talk were reported finding the Comanche Trail. They were convinced it would lead to Quana and the Comanche village. Only now did Carter tend to his leg. It was badly swollen and stiff and getting worse. His feet had blown up so much his boots had to be cut off. When his leg was revealed to the doctors, it was black and blue and covered with clotted blood from lacerations. But it wasn't broken. The doctor split it in any way just to be safe. As the examination was going on, trumpeters began sounding off for people to get ready and prepare their horses. There was no time for more medical treatment. Mackenzie had heard about Carter's condition and sent for him. They were going to be heading down the trail the Tonkwa found. Mackenzie told Carter that he was sending a number of soldiers back to a nearby fort. Their mounts were stolen and wouldn't be able to continue the pursuit. With Carter's leg injured as it was, Mackenzie told him that he could receive medical attention if he went with them. He was demoralized and exhausted. But when given the option to leave, he remembered Private Gregg and what he had came here to do. Carter refused to leave the expedition. Mackenzie let him know that if he went and his leg got worse, or if he lost his horse, he would be stranded. But Carter insisted, saying, If it is left to me, I go forward with the command. Seeing all he needed to see, Mackenzie nodded. But before he allowed Carter to leave, he had questions about Captain Hale, the man who had abandoned him in Blanco Canyon. Carter refused to say anything more than Hale and his men had made an error. You can be the judge as to whether or not he should have said more. Then Carter left and mounted his horse. 
even in his condition. It was time to continue the hunt for the Comanche. Carter, Mackenzie, and 500 soldiers followed the Tonko scouts along the Brazos River. To the west is the massive Caprock Escarpment, the barrier to the high plains. In the late afternoon, as the canyon opens into a valley, they find the remains of the true Comanche village, the main one. The village is empty. As the Comanche moved, they took with them over a thousand people, over three thousand horses, countless supplies, and lodges by the hundreds. Lodge poles and valuables have been left on the ground. It was clear the Comanche had left in a hurry. A village like this? It can't move fast. Every second counted for their escape. Incredibly, the Comanche were able to throw the Tonkwa off their trail. The path they left behind would cross and recross itself. The army was moving slowly, but by the morning of the second day, it was clear that the Comanche were moving for the high plains, up the Caprock Escarpment. It's a steep thousand-foot climb from the rolling plains below. Carter expresses amazement that the village could even manage it. It was exhausting for the soldiers. He, with his damaged leg, was grateful that he could do the majority of the climb on horseback. When they reached the top, Carter described what he saw. Quote, All were over and out of the canyon upon what appeared to be a vast, almost illimitable expanse of prairie. As far as the eye could reach, not a bush or tree, a twig or stone, not an object of any kind or living thing was in sight. It stretched out before us, one uninterrupted plain, only to be compared to the ocean in its vastness. End quote. The elevation at the top is around 3,000 feet. The previous days had been warm and sunny, but those weren't the conditions up here. In the early afternoon, Carter started to notice the temperature drop. The Tonks continued to follow the signs of the village through the buffalo grass. It was clear the Comanche were still trying to throw the army off the trail because it wasn't uncommon for the path to go over a bluff, down into the canyon, and then back up. The Comanche were trying to buy time, but the Tonks were able to keep the trail, and the army kept moving. The trail grew fresher. Then, in the distance, on a small ridge, Carter spots figures moving. Silhouettes on the skyline. The village is within reach, just a few miles off. But as the day went on, the temperature continued to drop. As the wind picked up, tearing through the soldiers' summer uniforms, Carter realized that they were running out of time. A norther was on its way. This, early in the season, a norther is rare. The army was not prepared for this. The wind and snow has the potential to kill the entire column if they do not conduct themselves properly. But with the village in sight, only two or three miles in the distance, the army picked up the pursuit. The Comanche, too, noticed that they were getting close. Quana had sent warriors to appear on the flanks of the column. Carter realized the purpose right away. These warriors were there for harassment. They wanted to draw the column away from the target, but Mackenzie didn't fall for it. The soldiers protected the mules and the ammo. Using the carbines to keep the warriors at a distance, they continued their march. As they drew closer, the sky became dark, and the wind began to howl. Temperatures now drop below freezing, and gusts of wind up to 50 miles an hour made the pursuit unbearable. But the army was encouraged when they started to come across discarded equipment from the village. They found lodge poles, tools, and buffalo skins, even puppies the Comanches had discarded. They were trying to lighten the load. The soldiers took what was useful. In all the excitement, Carter had hardly noticed his injured leg all afternoon. The Tonks began to paint themselves for the battle that was coming. They were within a mile of the village now. Carter believed it was time to overrun them. He writes, quote, It grew darker and colder. The wind whistled. The air grew thicker and more hazy, and soon a cold rain mingled with snow and sleet began to drive into our faces, through our bodies, and into the very marrow. This was the supreme moment, a crisis. Everyone was looking to Mackenzie to give the order to charge. It never came. End quote. In the eleventh hour, with sleet and snow, Mackenzie called off the march. Carter was furious. Despite the storm, he felt this was their chance. But Mackenzie saw it differently. The storm was getting worse. The men and horses were tired from days of long marches, and they had no fresh mounts like the Comanche did. He ordered the men to stop and set up camp. The norther intensified in the night. Some Comanche warriors hung by the fringes of the camp, but moved on when it was clear the soldiers weren't going to go anywhere. The men now shifted their focus to not freezing to death. The sleet and snow turned into hail that pelted the animals and left bruises on the bodies of the soldiers. They improvised canvas shelters to protect themselves. Mackenzie himself had to be wrapped in a buffalo robe to keep from getting hypothermia. But they survived the night. By morning, the storm broke. The following day was warm and beautiful. But the Comanche village was now gone. This was the final tragedy of Blanco Canyon. In the night, as Carter and the 4th Cavalry had shielded themselves from the norther, the Comanche village continued to move. 
The storm made it difficult to track the village the following day, but they also had to come to grips with some logistical problems. They were now 40 miles from their supply lines. Mackenzie had to turn back. Carter explains, quote, The animals were now suffering for water, and some were beginning to show clearly signs of giving out. Our chow, or rations, were growing slim. The Comanches, by that lucky storm for them, still had a night's march ahead of us, so he prudently, but most reluctantly, turned back. End quote. The frustration of both the soldiers and Mackenzie was obvious. The entire mission was an abysmal failure. At each turn, it seemed like the Comanche were a step ahead of them. And when the tables were seemingly going to turn, weather had prevented them from victory. Mackenzie's frustration became even more obvious on their return to Blanco Canyon. The Tonks discovered two Comanche stragglers and were able to funnel them into a ravine. Mackenzie, recklessly rushing to the front, took an arrow to the leg. Before the two lone Comanche were overwhelmed, another soldier was shot in the gut in the hand. In the aftermath of the expedition, both Carter and Mackenzie received medical treatment, but both were able to return to the field. Lieutenant Carter specifically would receive a Congressional Medal of Honor for his gallantry in the strategic retreat at Blanco Canyon. Despite the failure, this mission is an example of larger things to come. The Comanche were put on notice that the U.S. military was shifting its policy. S. E. Gwen wrote an article, quote, Previous military expeditions had violated Comancheria's borders and had introduced the Indians to the idea that their home ranges were no longer completely safe, but they had done nothing to change the basic balance of power. Now, in their deliberate penetration of the heartland, the Blue Coat leaders were signaling their intent not just to protect the frontier, but to destroy the raiders themselves, to find the wolves in the den and kill them. End quote. Comanche strength in the previous decades reigned supreme, but into the 1870s it was becoming obvious that it was now a bit of an illusion. Their population was small, and they were outgunned. Within four years, they would be forced to reservations. Bad Hand Mackenzie would be the man leading the way. Let me know in the comments if that's a story you want to hear. The Tonkwa scouts in the story were used by the military against groups like the Comanche. They had a long-standing rivalry. If you want to learn more about why they hated each other, take a look at this video. Thanks for watching.